Um, so today we have our first talk in this series on aquaculture, food security, and the environment. And I'm you really have the two best people in the world here to talk about this. So I'm really glad that you could come and hear them and meet with them afterwards. We're so lucky to have both. And I want to say up front, these two individuals are heroes getting here. We have Dave Little, who I'll introduce in a minute, from Scotland, flew all the way over here from Scotland on delays flights. And uh, Ron Hardy and his wife Barbara, who came from Idaho, and it took longer to get here than from Scotland today. And he just arrived, so we're really lucky to have them both. So let me introduce them both briefly up front, and they're both going to talk, and then we'll have a uh, discussion with all of us up front. I'll start with Ron Hardy, who's going to speak first. And um, I've been lucky to work with Ron. Ron and I have an interesting history. I'll let him um, say a few <laughs> words. I've been a thorn in Ron's side at times, and today he was probably thinking that again with this flight. But um, Ron is, uh, is really the world's leader in fish nutrition and aquaculture nutrition. Is um, I, I was going to introduce as the father of aquaculture. He corrected me today to say, no, he trained with the father of you know, aquaculture sciences. He's the son of aquaculture sciences. But he's been in this field for a long time, for the past 40 plus years, and has really seen a lot of changes and transitions in the aquaculture sector, and I think has a wealth of knowledge um, and really new insights that will be uh, very important, I think, for our discussion. Um, he's a professor in animal and vet sciences, but really spends his time directing the Aquaculture Research Institute at the University of Idaho and also runs the Hegeman um, Aquaculture Lab. So he oversees 40 plus scientists and staff uh, doing some really cool work that, that he'll talk about today. Um, but he's much broader than that when he's not actually in the lab, he's all over the world and he's in high demand on food and nutrition, or feed and nutrition sciences in aquaculture. Um, he'll talk about some of the some of the highlight uh, pieces of literature that he you know has really led at NRC and National Academy, but also has you know 300 publications um, on all sorts of topics that um, are really important to the issue of aquaculture feeds. So Ron is going to focus mainly on the marine aquaculture side, and one of the issues on the marine aquaculture side has always been. Uh, does it require so much fish meal and fish oil from wild caught feeds that we are actually depleting fisheries while we're trying to supplant them by you know having more cultured fish in the system and and uh, there's been so much progress in this area uh, that he will talk to you about so Ron's uh, work has really transitioned from uh, you know sort of nutrition sciences and and disease sciences to its what would be called nutrition genomics, and we'll talk a little bit about the new science in this area. Um, so I'm not going to go on too long. I just want to say it's really hard to find Ron. It's amazing that he is here. He's the hardest guy in the world to find, I think. You know, and he's all over the world. And when he's not at one of these meetings or in the lab or doing something, he's on his uh, boat with Barbara in Puget Sound or on the beach in Oregon, <laughs> and they really enjoy the marine environment so much. So he brings together this sustainable feeds issue really from his heart, and we're very glad to have you here. Um, Dave Little I also work with in China, but Dave's uh, history is different, you know, and he'll talk about where he started. Um, he's a professor of aquatic resources and development at the University of Stirling in Scotland, and has um, mostly focused on freshwater systems, but also a range of um, brackish water and marine systems. Um, in Asia and Africa, and deals quite a bit with the impacts of aquaculture and its role in society more broadly. Um, although Dave is also trained in biology, um, did his uh, uh, master's and bachelor's in biology, and then uh, did his PhD in aquaculture sciences mainly through um, the Aquaculture Research Institute in Thailand. So he and his family spent 15 years in Thailand um, really developing a lot of uh, the new and um, small scale systems that we see around the world that really enhance food security. And so I think a big gap has been what is the role of aquaculture in food security? And, um, and Dave is definitely prepared to talk about that because he works a lot in this, in this area. But he's also got a lot of science to share with you. So um, 
you know, this seminar is going to last for about 15 hours and just get comfortable. There's <laughs> a lot of new material here. Um, I work with Dave in China, and uh, and we've had some great interactions. And I'll let that, I'll let him tell some of his his stories there. But today we do have uh, Ron on the marine and Dave on the freshwater. We have both um, the environment and ecosystems as well as food security. And I have really asked them, look, you know, and, and it's their desire too. Let's get off of the standard talk on aquaculture that we all know, and dive into some of the new science and some of the new social science, some of the insights here, and I think uh, most of what you'll hear is new today. So Ron, let's start with you, and we're looking forward to it. Well, thanks, Roz, for the uh, introduction, and um, I don't think I'll go into the thorn in the side part in any great detail because I put on too many slides. I got an email from Roz yesterday, or today, no, yesterday or the day before saying, okay, you're only going to talk for uh, you know, 25 minutes, so try to limit it to 25 slides. At that time, I had 75, <laughs> so I made a great effort over about 10 minutes time to cut it down. I've got it down to about 63. <laughs> But some of them are just pictures, so I don't think it's going to take too long. Um, so, rather than belabor the point here, I'm just showing you the obligatory slide here. That these people farm fish, and yes, we eat them. The picture I took of China in January. I wish I'd taken another picture there because of all the live fish that were swimming around that were uh, coming from aquaculture, but also from the marine environment. So, anyway, just that's uh, my obligatory fish picture. So you've probably all seen some version, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, some version of this graph. And most of you kind of know what I'm talking about here in this graph, which shows the uh, this FAO data coming from the 50s up to today or last year, anyway. Showing the uh, in these colors here, the uh, wild capture of fish, which is the bottom two, the green and the white. And you can see it pretty much peaked out somewhere in the 80s and 90s. The green are fish that are caught for non-food use, either the fish meal or other uses. The white are those used for direct human consumption. And <clears throat> the orange is aquaculture. Now, you guys are all smart Stanford students, but you can see that's growing like crazy, huh? I mean, look at it. And what that's done basically has allowed the per capita income or per capita intake, I should say, of fish on the purple line there to continue to go up. So the growth. Uh, or the, the supply of fish has really been driven by aquaculture probably for the last 20 years or so, 15, 20 years. Um, uh, why is that, folks? Well, we've fished the sea too much. This is another graph from FAO I just picked up the other day, pinched it from them, showing, uh, I think, about a 30-year range here and a characterization of the stocks of, mar of marine fish and basically the overfished bunch are in the light blue up there. You can see that the percentage of overfished stocks has increased. Fully fished, decreased, underfished, not so much. Anyway, the point is our, our fishery supply from traditional capture sources are changing and they're not going to change, they're not going to get better. Let's just put it that way. That's the take home from that. Some salmon, you probably heard a lot of nasty things about aquaculture. Um, aquaculture is an evolving industry. It didn't start um, it had some problems. It still has problems. I try to work on these problems. A lot of people do. David works on these problems. But a lot of them are pretty innocuous, really. This is a picture I took down in Chile a couple years ago of a salmon farm, and it's out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, it's pretty benign, really. There's not a lot of things happening there. But wait for the next one. Other places, it's not so good. So this is a picture I can't take credit for. I, I got it off a friend of mine in, in China, but showing... It looks, like looks like a town, doesn't it? But it's not a town. Those are fish farms. And those are fish farms, I think, of Yellow Croaker in some bay someplace. And you can see they just are crowded together. Uh, it's just a mess, really. And you can imagine the effects of water, uh, of all this concentrated aquaculture on water quality and, and, um, and fish quality as well in the environment. So this is an example of where we don't want to go that we have to come up with ways in which to improve. 
And then just to put in context too, the top producers of farm fish, excluding salmon, are China, Indonesia, Philippines, Japan, Vietnam, Greece, Turkey, Taiwan, and India. Who's missing on there? Us. We are really not even in the, in the we don't, huh? I, uh, no salmon, I just, excluding salmon. That's why Norway and Chile aren't on there either. This is just purely marine species. So that's the, uh, the lineup of who's who in marine, in marine fish production. So anyway, I've kind of got you here there already. Marine aquaculture pr uh, production has to increase to, to meet supply. Demand's going to increase. We have more people. People are, incomes are rising in some of these countries. People want to eat higher quality fish. But that's a real challenge for us in marine aquaculture. Why is this? A couple reasons. Uh, a lot of the broodstock and larval sourcing are from wild or captive. The question is, why are they wild or captive? Many of them are still uh, captured from wild, uh, wild fingerlings or from wild broodstock anyway. So we haven't quite really closed the life cycle and incorporated this into a more um, uh, sensible system. Feeds for farm fish. We have real problems, and I'm going to talk your ears off on that in a minute. Health management. Prevention and treatment, this is an issue in the marine environment, mainly with parasites, but other diseases we never heard of until you get to China and all of a sudden, pew, all these fish are in one place. Things pop up that we really haven't encountered before. And uh, I don't know if you know anything about diseases in farm fish, but if you get a disease in a farm fish, you've got a big problem. Everybody dies. Uh, you can't treat them. You can't treat the water. You can't treat them with medication in the feed because it won't eat. So it's a real, you can just get a total wipeout and nothing flat. And then, of course, water quality and environmental issues. So the question I'm going to pose today, and I'm going to try to answer a little bit, is can marine aquaculture simply adopt technology that we've developed already to farm other species like salmon? And these uh, species, of course, have been uh, successful because of their unique reproduction. They produce great big eggs. The fish are big when they are hatch. They can eat prepared food. Have you ever seen a marine larvae? Well, that lady has. But anyway, they're so small you can't even see them. They hatch over three or five days. They're just tiny. The whole reproductive system in these animals is different. Salmon produce five, three, five, six, seven thousand eggs, maybe. Uh, marine fish, hundreds of thousands or millions or broadcast spawners. So it's a different system. They just hope a couple live, but there's not a lot of maternal input into the eggs. And that has implications on our, the, the, how difficult they are. Oh, yeah. Uh, how difficult they are to raise. Uh, vaccines have been a big, uh, big success story in salmonids, and you probably know a little bit about that. You maybe talked about that. And then advanced feeds, of course, we've done quite well with salmon and trout. Not so hot with marine fish. So the grand challenge that we face with, uh, with all aquaculture is to, to develop sustainable fish feeds. You probably also have heard that their annual production of uh, fish meal and oil is insufficient to support current feed formulations. We need to develop low fish meal feeds for marine fish now. We need to replace portions with alternative ingredients and at the same time make the feeds more efficient and less polluting. And that's uh, almost contradictory aims. And these improvements in feeds though is not the whole story. Everything you do in feeds has to be in the context of other factors that have been successful, or at least factors that have contributed to the success of, of salmon. And one of them is domestication, and the other is selective breeding. So anyway, f I'm going to just make the point, and I'm not going to go back to it much, that feeds and fish improvement go hand in hand. So replacing fish meal. We have lots of things we can replace fish meal with, mainly produced from oil seeds or grains, soy, wheat, corn. They're abundant. They're relatively inexpensive. They're Nutritional content is okay. They're not great, but uh, by blending them together, we can make a pretty decent uh, uh, product. Uh, they're also, you probably know, soy, wheat, and corn are primary ingredients in swine and poultry feeds. So you think, well, gee, if they work in swine and poultry, why don't we just uh, use them in fish? Well, one of the problems with that, particularly with marine fish, is that the sam uh, these uh, fish, I mean, these animals, swine and poultry, are omnivores. I'm sure you haven't taken apart a pig or a chicken, but their intestines are very long and very complex, and they're able to tolerate these, uh, these grains. You take apart a salmon or a marine fish, their intestine is barely as long as the animal. 
things go in and they come out really quick. So they don't have the same digestive capacity as do these omnivorous fish, although catfish and tilapia are closer to swine and poultry than uh, the marine fish. So this is pretty challenging for another reason. Fish meal is not simply protein and amino acids. It's a very complex product. There's over 150 compounds in fish meal, many of them with uh, biologically, biological activity, fatty acids, minerals, vitamins, high energy. But plant proteins are really different. What is a plant protein? Generally, it's a seed that is basically a little capsule that contains the nutrients to support a growing little sprout. So they're made, plant proteins are made in seeds, but they're packed in there for the little seed to, or the little sprout to take off. So that's really a different type of protein. I'm not going to go into this much more, but a different structure of protein than muscle protein or tissue protein from animals. And so that plays into this whole process. And the other thing is, and I'll get back to this in a little later too, is seeds play defense. Seeds don't want animals to eat them. Or if they do, they want them to pass right through their digestive tract and get scattered around and, uh, and, and uh, sprout elsewhere. So there are factors, anti-nutritional factors in seeds that are, are tricky and difficult to deal with. They're high in non-soluble carbohydrates. These are carbohydrates that people with it, uh, monogastric animals, including us, can't digest. Think beans. Beans are an example. You know what happens when you eat beans? Yeah, you don't digest all of it. You get some. Anyway, anti-nutrients, indigestible phosphorus is another thing. The phosphorus stored in seeds is in, an, in, a, in a bound form so that it can be released for the growing seed. We can't digest it. Monogastric animals can't digest it, fish can't digest it. And then, as I said, non-tissue protein. So step back a little bit. Why is this? Think about this a little bit. We're used to thinking about terrestrial life. We see it all around us. So what is it? It's a bunch of plants converting sunlight and carbon dioxide into seeds, grasses, tubers, nuts, and berries, other things that, that we, meaning animals, uh, in one form or another, eat in our food chain. But when you go to well, seed, as if seed byproducts then are the main ingredients in animal feeds. That's where they come from. We go to the marine environment, though, it's a whole different story. We don't have seeds out there. We don't have leaves. Basically, the primary producers are marine algae. And they're the first level of the food web. They convert sunlight into, into products. But basically, after that, all of the other animals that consume marine algae are filter feeders or little teeny zooplankton that uh, consume those, and everybody above that in the food web is a carnivore. Maybe not a carnivore like you think of a tiger, but they're eating animals, they're not eating plant products. So that's true of all of our marine fish of interest, the ones that people want to grow and uh, want to pay for. So this reality really throws another monkey wrench into our efforts to convert uh, these carnivorous fish into vegetarians by, by feeding them plant-based diets. So things have changed a lot in the last um, 15 years, thanks to old Roz over here, who published a paper back in 2000, who pointed this out, uh, that we're on a collision course with the supply of fish meal and the growth of aquaculture, for which he's very famous. Uh, anyway, uh, fish meal levels and feeds across the board, basically, have decreased over this time by about 50%. And part of that is driven by economics. The feed price of fish meal, or the fish meal price doubled in 2006, 2007. I mean, just doubled. It had been in a trading range for 30 years, and all of a sudden, boom, it went up more than double, and it stayed up there. And so what's happened over this, this period is fish meal proteins have been replaced by plant proteins and animal, land animal proteins. That's not been that hard to take 50% out. Boy, the next 50% is really going to be hard. Anyway, what's happened? The outcomes with salmon and trout have really not been very dramatic. We've done quite well with that. We uh, see fish growing, flourishing, they're healthy. Uh, feed efficiency is unchanged. So that's, that's worked out well. But with marine species, no. Uh, growth is slower. Feed conversion ratios are higher. The industry average before 2007 for marine fish in the Mediterranean, for example, was about 1.4, 1.5. Now it's over two. Mortalities are up a little bit. Well, not a little bit, more than that. And all of these tell us something. They tell us that those fish are not flourishing on these diets. 
And they're also telling us that the marine aquaculture uh, industry faces some big challenges as I mentioned earlier, and they're not making any money. It's hard to uh, make money when your feed conversions go up by that amount, and your growth is slower, and your uh, feed costs are up, and mortalities are up. So those are challenges that are pretty dramatic. So why are these different? Well, I think part of it is domestication. Um, marine fish are really wild fish. Uh, many species, the broodstock are captured from the wild, as I mentioned. We have so many species that the life cycle is closed, but it's only recently, and it's not really gotten to the point where there's been any long-term domestication and generations of, of selecting fish for broodstock that are more adept to, to culture. Um, the other tricky thing with these fish is many of them are four to five years old before they mature. So with trout and salmon, we've got it down to two, three years, but um, some of these are four to five years. It just takes longer. And here's another weird thing about some of these marine fish. Some of these things turn, start out as boys. Two years later, they turn into girls, the same fish. So now you've got another complication. Did you know that? Well, David's been teaching me this way for all of Yeah. So anyway, they've got some other issues there. Uh, with selective breeding for growth, this has been active in uh, Atlantic salmon in Norway and Scotland for quite some, quite a few years, 20, maybe 25 years. But with trout, we've uh, been pouring it on with that, but really accelerated since 2000, and I'll talk about that. Marine fish, though, there's really been no serious effort. Okay, there are efforts. We go around and people will tell you what they're doing, all this stuff. But we looked at some of this, and it's, it's really not advanced very much. And in order to do this, you have to close the life cycle, and <coughs> the reproductive uh, behavior is another issue. With trout and salmon, we can take a, a male and a female for family selection. We can spawn them in a bucket, basically, and raise these fish and go forward. A lot of these marine fish uh, exhibit uh, behavior involving mass spawning in tanks, and so it's really tricky to see who's, who's, who's being crossed with whom. So that makes it hard to do single parent crosses and establish pedigrees, which is essential for a selective breeding. I was over in uh, Greece not too long ago, and um, people were showing me all these sea bream with white livers. And you can't tell that very well in that, these pictures. You guys know where the liver is? It's one of those things in the middle there. Anyway, <laughs> they're supposed to be red. You know what liver looks like. And these fish had really white livers, which don't show up too well in this. They didn't know what to do. They said, oh, so what's with the white livers? Oh, well, they, yeah, they've been that way for a while, and well, it's not that important. But uh, when I looked into it, these diets had been really screwed up. They had really been order for, they, they saw these white livers and said, okay, we need more iron. They poured so much iron in there that they created an oxidation problem in the tissue. Iron's a pro-oxidant. So a lot of these changes that have been made in marine fish have really pushed fish in the wrong direction. So we really need to step back and take a more holistic approach not just to the to the uh, to the uh, fish, but look and, and look at their physiology, their biochemistry, their diets, and see what's wrong. And now I come to my best part. You've all seen this Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? I'm really quite proud of this. I didn't make this up. Maslow did in the 30s. You know what this is. So basically, the lower level. This is how human societies are generated. This is very simplified here, but. At the bottom level, basic needs, food, shelter, air, uh, what you need to basically survive. You're not going to flourish, but you're going to survive. You go up the next level, things are going to be a little better. You've got safety, security needs that are being met. You're going to be better fed. The next level, social needs are being met, friends, communities, so on and so forth. You get specialization in societies begin to get people to do certain things, they recognition, so on and so forth, and then self-actualization, which I guess means you can think of higher order thoughts, art, philosophy, so on and so forth. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a sociologist, but that's my simplified version of it. So I looked at this, and I came up with something new. You ready? Hardy's hierarchy of feeds. I thought that really made a lot of sense because what we have in a, in a way is we have at the bottom the nutritional requirements to sustain life. This doesn't mean the fish is going to grow well, but it's not going to die. But it's not necessarily going to be fast growing or reproduction may be impaired and so on and so forth. We go up to the next level. We need to know the nutritional needs for optimum 
growth, health, and reproduction. To get there to the next level, we need to know more about feed ingredients, like I mentioned earlier, how they affect fish, what, what can we do to improve them. Once we know that, now we can start to formulate feeds that really make sense. And then, only then, can we reach our goal, which is sustainable feeds. So here's my pitch. Salmon and trout, we're kind of up there already. Marine fish, we're not there. We're way down here. And my gripe, my observation, I should say, is that the producers of marine feeds are mainly operating as if we're up there. This is what I'm seeing around the world. Or not. Maybe for some species we are, but for the most part, we're still down there. So we got some making up to do here. So another question or another thing I want to point out is where do nutrient requirements come from? Who says what's a nutrient requirement? Is it all the scientific papers that everybody has to chew up? No, there's an entity called the National Research Council, which you probably know about, that puts together these, these bulletins from time to time that summarizes all of the exam knowledge and tries to say this is what we know today. These are the nutrient requirements of species. It's considered the gold standard uh, around the world. This version was published in 2011. Uh, they have these for other species. This actually started with Woodrow Wilson. Did you know that? Um, he wanted to make sure that the Army's mules and horses could be, and then there'd be enough chickens for everybody. Anyway, they have them on 14 different species. Here's just a couple examples, poultry, beef cattle, dairy cattle. This has been going on for a long time. And we've been doing this for fish now since 1973. The first one came out. It was about 35 pages. And there have been a couple updates over the years. The most recent one until the one I just showed you was 1993. Uh, the committee that worked on this, I had the privilege of chairing that committee uh, with a bunch of luminaries from around the world. You can see we were very formal when we first met, but uh, then we kind of loosened up a little bit. And finally, we ended up in China uh, you know, with uh, as we got to know each other. It was a very, very wonderful experience. What I want to show you this, other than brag about myself, was uh, here's um, a graph or a table here that shows you the freshwater um, fish requirements for amino acids. And it's a lot of numbers here. Don't worry about the numbers so much. We have, we're just in this table, we're, we're contrasting what, we, what was in the old one, what's in the new one, so they're a little different. The point is, there's a lot of numbers in there. The different species, catfish, trout, salmon, common carp, tilapia, the ones we chose to focus on. Here's what we know about mar marine fish. OK, what do you notice there? <laughs> a lot of numbers aren't there. OK, here's what we know about f uh, vitamin requirements of freshwater fish. More numbers. Oops, there's marine fish. Minerals. Oh, yeah, more numbers. Oops, nothing there. So the bottom line is, we, for a lot of these important fish, we really don't know their nutritional requirements. This wasn't a problem when we could make feeds that contained lots of fish meal and oil because they kind of papered over our lack of knowledge. But as we've reduced this, uh, the levels of fish meal and uh, shift to plant protein sources, we don't really know. And now we can't really formulate feeds rationally. That's one of our biggest challenges with marine fish. So, back to the hierarchy of feeds. That's why we're there. We had the same thing happen back when I was about 12 years old. No, I was, old, I was older than that. <laughs> there was a uh, El Nino event uh, in the in 1970s. You know what those are when there's no, you know, anyway. And uh, so there's a global shortage of fish meal. And in the US, um, uh, fish meal levels in trout and catfish were quite high, and they were greatly reduced because of this big raise in prices. And as I said, I just asked uh, Roz, can I say this? Things went to hell in a handbasket. Huge financial losses at that time. And the problem was that the trout and salmon were still down at the bottom of my pyramid. So what happened then was the US embarked on a really big projects, uh, a lot of well-funded university projects and government projects to figure out all this information. And it really led to efforts that uh, led to knowledge of nutritional requirements, nutritional needs, feed ingredients. And as a, as a consequence, things were improved. And we got up to the level where we can now really rationally formulate feeds. So that's where we are today. We got low fish meal feeds in, in salmon and trout. 
We've got selective breeding of trout that uh, now we can feed trout an all plant protein diet, no fish meal, no land animal protein. The selected fish grow like crazy. It took us uh, 16 years, but we did it. Um, we've also improved the, the feed ingredients, and so consequently we've kind of followed this, this pyramid, and it's worked. Here's, a, here's an example of the challenge now we, fe we face with, with uh, marine fish. One of the uh, nutrients, or it's actually considered a conditional nutrient, meaning it's sometimes required, sometimes not required, is called taurine. You ever heard of taurine? It's actually in energy drinks and baby formulas. It's a um, kind of an amino acid, but not a structural amino acid. It's very prevalent in animal tissues, milk, things like that. Um, and until we started reducing, well, before we reduced fish meal levels, we didn't even think about it because we had so much fish meal in the diet. We, who needs taurine? But now we have much lower levels of fish meal, and the trend is to reduce it further, uh, and that's lowering the dietary taurine levels. And just FYI, there is no taurine in plants or seeds. Its main function is a constituent of bile acids. It has other functions in the body, but that's a big one. And the other thing that's tricky on this, soy proteins bind with bile acids in the distal intestine and carry them out in the feces. So they actually remove them from the body. It's almost like you're bleeding. You're losing this stuff. So anyway, this uh, makes things worth with marine fish. This didn't pop up in our world until uh, 1990s. Uh, there was a collapse of the Japanese sardine fishery that uh, prevented the Japanese from using all these fish in their, in their yellowtail feeds. They switched to high soy feeds. All of a sudden, there's this new disease. It's fish don't grow, and they got something they, the Japanese called green liver syndrome. It opened up the fish. The liver was green. It was found to be an accumulation of bile pigments, probably, uh, most likely, or for sure, because bile acid synthesis was blocked by lack of taurine. It was being wiped out of the body and not replaced in the diet. And when they supplemented feeds with taurine, it prevented the condition. This is still uh, an evolving story even today because of this issue with soy. Soy seems to exacerbate this problem. One of the uh, things that's recently been discovered is a, a new compound called soy statin. It's a uh, five, um, five amino acid protein that's in soy when soy is partially digested. And it actually acts as a medication. I mean, people are developing this as a medicine for people with high cholesterol. You can feed the soy statin. It'll take uh, bile acids and therefore cholesterol out of your body and lower your cholesterol. Kind of like something called cholestyramine, which is another resin that works in the same way. But anyway, from the fish point of view, that's not good. <coughs> so we uh, now routinely supplement taurine in, uh, in our plant-based diets. I mentioned already plants play defense. These are some of the anti-nutrients that are present, trypsin inhibitors that affect uh, digestion, interfere with trypsin uh, goitrogens that affect the function of the, of the thyroid. Gossipol affects reproduction. There's some compounds that, as I said, put kind of silly, taste bad, but actually they really do taste bad. Fish still take a bite and right out again. And then another problem called distal enteritis, which is an inflammation of the intestine. We're a little fuzzy on what causes that. And the other weird thing is, fish are so much more sensitive than this to these compounds than are we, pigs, chicks, and rats. Why? Because they've never seen them before. They haven't been eating soybeans. We have. For, for, for oodles of generations. So those of us in our, in our genetic, uh, in our ancestry that couldn't tolerate this, they're gone. So only us tough people that can handle this, and tough rats and chickens are still around. So we've already seen selections, so to speak, for tolerance to these compounds. So enteritis is an inflammatory condition. It kind of resembles colitis. It gets worse over time. It's dose dependent with how much soy you put in a trout diet. Like, for example, in 12 weeks we don't see it, 24 weeks we do. You see all these morphologi morphological changes in the intestine. And one of the other crazy things is not all species uh, develop this when they're fed high soy diets. We see it easily, we can easily induce it in salmon and trout. We can see it in sea bass and sea bream. I can't, we, nobody's ever been able to find it in Atlantic cod. We don't know exactly why that is. But anyway, now we're going to get real deep into the gut here. This is a dissected rainbow trout intestine. So here's the stomach up here. These are the pyloric cica, where a lot of enzymes and digestion takes place. 
and then the distant, the, the, what we call a proximal or the front of the intestine. We don't really have a small intestine and large intestine, but we have a proximal and distal section. You can see they look a little different. Um, that's where we get enteritis, right where that junction is between the proximal and distal section. Little piece. Here's what it looks like under a microscope. This is a normal villi. If you've seen these pictures, haven't you? Like high school health, anyway. These are the villi that stick out in your wall of your intestine. And uh, nutrients are absorbed by the enterocytes here on the side and then carried off into the body. That's what happens when we feed a high soybean diet. So you don't have to be a histologist to know that one on the right doesn't look right. A little more detail, here's a nice looking one. Again, the enterocytes that are absorbing nutrients, carry them into the bloodstream and off to the body. Here's one that doesn't look so good, high soy diet. and. Uh, Actually, that's kind of hard to see, but let's put them side by side here, and you can see them better. Here's good. We just saw that one. There's bad. See all the inf inf inflammation or inflammatory cells, those black or those dark things. The villi don't look, or the enterocytes don't look right. God, that's my phone. Um, anyway, we can see this pretty clearly in these fish. So we started a selective program uh, in breeding of trout uh, in about uh, 16 years ago at my lab. It's a, what we call family-based selection. We, uh, we have our broodstock. We identify them with their pit tags. We figure out who we should spawn with whom. We make single male, female crosses. We incubate these. We measure the growth of, of these fish when fed a plant-based diet. We choose the top performers. We pit tag them. We put them out again. We start over. We've been doing this for 16 years. Here's what we got. When we started our founding stocks, grew about 180 to 200 grams in five months, fed the soy diet. Now, 2014, 2015, we're up to 380. That's just from natural selection. So we think that's something that could be applied to marine fish and other species too. Um, one of the weird things about these selected fish is they don't develop enteritis when we feed a high soy diet. So here's the uh, non-selected fish with the crummy looking villi uh, when fed the high soy diet. And here's our selected fish. They look normal. And here's the same two groups of fish fed the, uh, the, plant, or the fish, uh, fish meal based diet. So these all look good. That doesn't. So we've uh, all of a sudden realized, hey, we have a new tool here to look at this. This model trout or our selected strain really exhibits some pretty interesting traits that we could exploit, and but not only exploit, but use to study and see what mechanisms uh, or what physiological changes or what genomic changes have occurred in these fish. And the goal is to understand what's going on, number one, but also see if we can develop markers that we can then go to other species and accelerate the process of genetic improvement through selection. Do you follow me on that? So what we've done, we've compare, compared these two strains, uh, looking at differences in, in metabolism, protein synthesis, turnover, identify markers with sequencing, uh, look at how they digest and, and uh, how they transport nutrients into the gut with certain intestinal transporters. But most another weird thing is, or not weird, another way we looked at this is, is there are there any difference in the microbiome in these fish? And I asked uh, Raj, do you know what the microbiome is? And she said she wasn't real sure. So I'm going to tell you what the mic. I don't have to skip over these slides now. So this is what this is. These are all the bacteria, viruses, and fungus that live in our gut. And this microbiome contains more DNA than the body, our bodies do. A lot more. And likely these, this, this microbiome, this, this microbial population or microbial community that we carry around in our body, co-evolved with each species. And it interacts. It's not passive. It's, it interacts with the host. It helps modulate its cell development. It regulates immune responses, fights pathogens directly and indirectly, and it also provides nutrients and helps digest the food. So it really plays an important role. It's a it's it's a it's an important part of of our of our life. I couldn't resist this one. Um, how many of you eat yogurt? Oh, good. So here's the guy that you could blame for that. This, a, a scientist named Metlakov. And he proposed the beneficial effects of, of uh, 
taking lactobacilli through eating yogurt years and years ago, so it would help you to digest milk and cheese products. And so he realized that when you do this, you're, you're, you're actually consuming live lactobacillus species. And this led to the development of probiotics, live bacteria as a healthy food supplement. But he also understood that this stuff isn't going to work unless you give the food that these probiotics uh, flourish on along with it. So it, for probiotics to be effective in animal and fish, tish, uh, fish feeds, we have to do the same. One of the things that has really changed this whole world is our way of understanding how to identify bacteria in, in, and microorganisms basically in the gut. For 100 years, and this is what my mom used to do, my mother was a bacteriologist, uh, grow them on a Petri dish, basically. That was it. What you saw was what was there. Not anymore. Now we have genetic sequencing methods to identify all the microorganisms in your, in your gut, and guess what? There are about 10 times, or I don't know how many times, more anaerobic species that would never grow in a Petri dish that are there uh, working away in your gut, making you healthy or unhealthy. <clears throat> some, make, uh, some of these species produce antimicrobial compounds and fight the bad guys. Some promote tight cell junctions and influence, uh, uh, influence basically intestinal function. Others are not so good. They produce toxins. They cause inflammation and infection. So it's pretty tricky. So in aquaculture, when we feed our diets, we're changing things. In, natural, in, in the wild fish, natural food that the fish eats continually renews and maintains the microbiome. But in aquaculture, we're feeding artificial diets. And when we looked at these artificial diets, which, believe it or not, I got in a big fight with a bunch of people one time because they told me, Oh no, we run this stuff through an extruder at 220 degrees C and it's sterile. Well, it's sterile for about five seconds. It's not sterile for very long. When we looked at it, we see a huge difference between a plant-based plant diet and a fish meal-based diet. I mean, they're 92, 93% of the differences in the bacteria we can attribute to, to that. So we uh, fed these to the different strains and, and to see what happened, Compa and we're busy comparing all these different factors to see if we can figure out the relative importance of each one. And I'll just show you a couple of things we've just recently found here. So here's selected, non-selected, fed a fish meal diet. And you don't have to understand what this means, but all the different colors are kind of smeared together. There's no real breakout. We can't assign any difference in these bacteria to uh, one diet or, the, or one uh, strain or another. However, when we look at the plant-based diet, we see a huge difference between the strains. I mean, again, all you got to do is look at the blue and red dots and you can see they're different. So when we look at the non-selected fish on this diet, bingo, there's the difference. We look <coughs> at it in the non-selected fish, they're back to the same. What we've discovered, and we don't get this, is when we feed the plant-based diet, which has different, highly different, bacteria and other microorganisms in the gut, over time, the population converges and becomes similar to that of the fish meal diet. That's really weird. We don't understand that. So we're working on that. Anyway, back to my hierarchy, which I'm so proud of. Here we are. That's our marine fish. There's where we got to go. I worked really hard on making this animation work. I'm not the most technically savvy guy, so I just want you to prove, you know, you get the drift there. So we got to move the marine fish up the pyramid. It took us 25 or 30 years to do this with trout and salmon, but using new knowledge and smart research from some of the high throughput technologies, I think we can accelerate this process in the important marine species. I think the ones that we're going to be most successful with are European sea bass, sea bream, turbot, yellow croaker, Japanese flounder. These are ones where the life cycle is closed and uh, they're doing quite well. Other challenging species where we really haven't got to that point yet include tuna and grouper, just to name a few. But the primary drivers are going to be high throughput technologies coupled with traditional physiology and histology. Um, just to mention, there are new ingredients coming down the road. Bacterial proteins, we're pretty keen on those. They have a low environmental footprint, low inputs, 
and, and um, they look really promising right now. We're also seeing um, some new products come on the market that are soy products that have undergone fermentation, which basically, you know what that is, you're adding bacteria and other microorganisms, sometimes yeast, that actually chew up uh, some of the constituents in soy that are causing problems. So that's looking pretty promising too. But basically, selection based on genetic markers, to sum up, I mentioned that already. So here's my predictions. This is it. Better pay attention to my last slide. I think we're going to see in the next couple of years here more robust larvae and fry as a, as a, re as a result of improved selection or improved uh, hatchery practices and better starter feeds. I think we're going to see more uh, imp improved balance, what I call balanced feeds for post-juvenile marine fish. This is where all the money goes. This is where the money is made or lost and where the health of the fish is really affected. And I'm going to predict that the FCRs, meaning how much food you got to feed to get a unit of growth, will fall at least by 25% in the next few years. We're going to see fish meal decrease uh, in the diet. And we're going to see a better utilization of functional feeds to improve fish health and reduce loss to parasites. And I know I didn't talk about fish oil, even though it's a huge problem. I'm hopeful that marine algae products, which are really expensive right now, will come down in price and fish, fish oil prices will go up and we're going to see a convergence of these prices such that marine algae products will become economically viable. So thanks very much.